इंडिया इज द थर्ड लार्जेस्ट वेस्ट जनरेटर इन द वर्ल्ड वे आर जनरेटिंग ऑलमोस्ट सिक्सटी टू मिलियन टन ऑफ वेस्ट दर इज डेफिनेटली नो शॉर्टेज ऑफ ट्रैश इन आर कंट्री हाउ यू कैन डू इट मोर एफिशियंटली इज द क्वेश्चन पैनिंग प्लास्टिक इज नॉट द वे फॉरवर्ड द बस वर्ड वर ईवी एंड सोलर दैट्स majorly where the money was going into into sexy businesses if you like to call it hello you are listening into the climate clock podcast a show where we discuss everything related to climate change and sustainability uh, well in the last few episodes we discussed how we can make change at an individual level waste management uh, at homes is the way to go as well so let's take that forward and discuss it in greater detail we have with us rahul nanani who is the ceo and co-founder of recircle which is the clean tech innovator as well thank you rahul for joining us on CNBC TV 18 and congratulations on the fundraise as well well recircle recently raised funds from 3i partners flipkart ventures and acumen fund as well but before i talk to you more about what these funds will be used for let's start with the basics thank you firstly sonal thank you for having me on the show and helping us amplify the work that we do uh, so you're right i mean i think uh, when i was growing up uh, there was never a thought that okay i'm i'm going to make a living out of scavenging of clearing waste from landfills especially when i had my uh, studies in finance but uh, i would say it somehow happened to me so back in 2015 my co-founder gurashish and i went for something called the google startup weekend uh, which is essentially like a 3 day seminar where you come and pitch an idea and uh, and i was still studying my cfa my partner was working in the real estate sector sector previously and uh, this opportunity came to us so when we were researching on what we want to do and this is a uh, uh, one of the sectors was like figuring out out what we can do with waste and what drove me to the sector is largely because when coming from the finance field the numbers was of course something that did drive me in the sector and uh, during our preliminary research we found out that uh, india was actually importing trash from rest of the world so we are actually importing tons and tons of garbage from us europe and middle east just to keep our recycling industries running and this number was not a small number it was a billion dollar plus export import bill that we were having for actually importing trash and that felt odd right like uh, having been born and brought up in mumbai uh, you never we I never thought that we have a shortage of trash. Yeah. <laughs> as compared to everything that we have shortage of, but there's definitely no shortage of trash in our country. Uh that basically was a you know one of the things that I got me into the sector itself. Uh that why are we importing trash uh, even though we have so much trash in our own country? And uh that being the, the guiding path, but also after that we went and went and visited the landfill. So mm. uh I think 99% of the people and like me I was as naive as everybody else. has never gone to a landfill site mm. and nor nor do we even know where it exists mm. um in mumbai we have the largest dump site in asia which is the devna dumping ground yeah. and uh, in early 2016 just when we were launching there was this massive fire that happened at the dump site and there was this iconic image that nasa took from space where they were where you could actually see that fire burning from space it was yeah. that large and uh, it was burning for almost 7 to 8 days 9 days consecutively post the fire doused out uh, we went to the land, we went to the area around the dump site worked with this ngo called apnale to find out what actually happens over there and there were a couple of things that we found out uh, the first being that these fires was a was not a one off situation but it was an actual it happens almost on on a every second or a third day itself largely because of there's of course a methane gas that gets trapped mm-hmm. in and which is where the fires out of especially in the summer time uh, that being and but this particular day there was the fire escalated and the wind was blowing towards south bombay hmm. so that's when the entire city woke up yeah. <laughs> to realize that okay there's a big issue coming up but the second and most astonishing fact that we found out was that the average life expectancy of people just living around the dump site these are not people that work in the dump site okay hmm. these are just living on the periphery in the slum areas was 37 years of age oh and that was shocking for me yeah. uh you know it's in the heart of mumbai city if you see the devna dump site and it's affecting the people right living around it mm. how soon is it going to start affecting the rest mm. of us mm. uh so those two things got me into the space of course the numbers because i come from the financial background and uh, and then of course the the reality reality check in life in terms of actually going and seeing what happens with your trash uh drove me in the sector and now it's of course we've been doing this for the last 8 years so there's a lot more that has happened in that 8 year journey to be able to make sure that 
now i'm going to make it that we are in this space and we're going to make sure make a large impact in this space itself oh yes there's more trash but there's more awareness as well thanks to people like you but you know what's surprising is what you told me we were actually importing trash uh in a country which is uh, one of the most populated in the world as well but in india itself how big of a problem is waste uh, how much of it does get recycled if we talk about broader numbers in terms of chronology where do, where do we stand so india is the third largest waste generator in the world uh, we're generating almost 62 million tons of waste and uh, the argument is uh, simple in that sense that okay we are the largest population so we are also going to generate mm-hmm. large amount of waste but that's not the problem the problem lies that nearly nearly 80 to 90% of this waste gets is remains untreated and is mm. getting dumped into landfills and oceans mm. and that's the bigger problem that it's mm. creating right that mm. if we are going to generate more and more waste but we need to figure out how we are able to manage this to give you some perspective because these numbers of 62 million tons is so large that you have no idea what it looks mm. like um, a city like mumbai uh, or delhi or bangalore uh, is generating about 8 to 9000 tons of waste every single day which is equivalent to the weight of almost 1500 full grown elephants wow and that's happening every single day we're generating that much waste in any big metro city that we that we're living in and imagine that 80 or 90% of this is remains fully untreated every single day and is just reaching our landfills and oceans so the problem is large hmm. uh, but the problem is not waste it's a problem of disposal yeah. it's a problem that we have to fix ourselves yeah. and we have to set up more infrastructure so it's we are only going to generate more and more waste and that's what the trends keep saying uh, with the development that's happening in our country but we need to figure out how we're going to manage this okay well you're right because as development happens it's not possible to reduce waste but of course you can treat that and that's where recycle comes into the picture as well so tell us about your work there's collection drives that you organize you take up dry waste and you recycle it as well so where do you stand in the entire supply chain and how does it work so we like to look at this sector a bit differently firstly we don't like calling ourselves as a waste management company mm. we are a resource recovery enterprise mm. so what what's waste for everybody is actually a resource for yeah. us uh and if you start relooking and rethinking the term waste itself that's when your that's when your mindset starts changing mm. because if you look at waste then it typically what means as waste is what you dump out yeah. or you throw out away but if you think out of think of it as a resource then you think of actually what can happen post Uh, the collection of this material that gets discarded so right now at recircle uh, we're recovering almost 10000 kgs of waste every hour every day from over 300 locations across india and uh, the only way that we can do this is because we built an inclusive business model where we actually partner with local scrap dealers mm-hmm. and aggregators and waste management companies that help us collect this material mm-hmm. as compared to you know looking at doing it all ourselves mm-hmm. because the problem is so large that mm-hmm. we can't solve this alone mm-hmm. and uh, there's already a large informal waste economy that mm-hmm. actually not just makes a living but is also doing the dirty work of cleaning up mm-hmm. after us mm-hmm. so uh, our model revolves around working with these collectors uh, that help us collect this material making sure that this material that gets collected is then channelized to the right processing facility so on the other side there's also a uh, lot of informal recycling that ends up happening but we make sure that it's going to a formalized recycler so that there's no mo- that recycling actually leads to good and not bad mm. in that sense so there's leading to go sending it making sure it only goes to registered recyclers and the material that this flows through our supply chain is then sold as plastic credits to businesses to help them go plastic neutral so We are primarily a B two B clean tech company. Got it. While we do a lot of work on consumer awareness mm. in terms of collection drives, in terms of workshops, mm. uh, in terms of ensuring that uh, you know that we are able to spread the message through our social media, through offline stuff as well. But what we believe at Recircle is that if you want large impact to happen, we need the big companies and the big guys yeah. to actually take action mm-hmm. on this. and which is where what we do so we largely work on formalizing the supply chain mm. uh selling these plastic credits to brand owners and with the money that we receive from these plastic credits we actually incentivize our collector and recycler mm. to basically become more formalized mm. as a part mm. of our supply chain so they have an in- additional income a uh, perspective where they actually make more money by working with us by doing exactly what they were doing while making sure that you know they were able to provide them with uh, health checkup camp social security because it's very very informal right mm-hmm. in that sense 
so that's what we are largely doing and then of course there are the smaller stuff in terms of uh, capacity building for the informal workers collection drives that we conduct for consumers in mumbai so making sure that whatever drive is that you're discarding we have almost a bi monthly drive where you can sign up and get uh, all your drive is collected uh, drive is uh, uh, recycled by us and then we bring it to our collection center sort segregate into almost 40 different categories and then that's sent for register to proper processing or recycling post that Okay so that recycling happens across cities or is it in some cities for now No so uh, it's a it's a p- partner based approach so mm-hmm. we have 300 collectors in 300 locations in uh-huh. India we have 45 processors which are plastic waste processors mm-hmm. across the country itself so uh, if the material gets collected from Mumbai it goes to the closest recycler mm-hmm. located next to Mumbai to basically optimize our operations as well and similarly if it gets collected from Guwahati in Assam mm-hmm. it gets goes to the closest processor next to Guwahati in Assam take so, that point yeah. so you basically connect whatever is based the resources basically not waste from consumers recycle it and ensure that corporates are also participating in that by by bra- bl- buying those plastic credits yes yeah, so uh, there's a uh, so there's a policy called extended producer responsibility Correct. or epr hmm. uh, and all so epr has made it mandatory for brands that produce plastic as packaging to hmm. recover as much plastic they put in the market hmm. so in simplicity let's say a beverage bought beverage brand and if they are selling 10000 bottles in the market they need to collect sort segregate and recycle these 10000 mm. bottles and showcase to the relevant government authority that they are going plastic neutral mm. now this is where we come into the picture and we enable these large fmcg companies to collect sort segregate recycle it provide them end to end traceability of where the material got collected how was it uh, collected who collected and how it was recycled and convert these into plastic credits so easier way to understand is like how carbon credits work yeah we are basically mm. digitizing the plastic supply chain and basically converting those into plastic credits and mm. selling these to these brand owners which is on the brand side mm. uh, and then on the consumer side of course we make sure that the waste gets collected from their houses and offices so now since the time epr regulations have been um, uh, com- have come out as well a lot of brands are doing that but there are there still some challenges that they are facing or you're seeing a lot of demand for you know these brands to come to you <coughs> people like you and ask for your help here so of course uh, the the pollution control board and the government has put out a lot of policies and epr being one of them uh, it was a slow start mm. uh, i would say uh, 2016 when the policy came out and it was supposed to be implemented from 2018 onwards uh, but in the initial 2018 to 2020 we didn't see too many ba- brands actually take this up but uh, now we're seeing a lot of traction coming in that space um, the the government authorities have also got more stricter uh the the businesses have also started realizing uh, you know that this is something as a part of their uh, of their obligation mm. to clear out plus a lot of these larger businesses have also committed to their global sustainable goals mm. so as a part of that also they are basically recovering this material so yes while it was a slow start but i think there's momentum that's picking up now and then there's a lot more that is expected to happen in the next few years as well that's good to know but i have to ask you in these drives what are some of the weirdest things that you've collected which people think is a dry waste or some or something that can be recycled but it is not so uh, i think uh, there's a lot of stuff that comes to our collection centers uh, i think the last uh, thing i remember there were like the den- there's a full packet of dentures that we got uh, we've got uh, you we've got lots of clothes we've got uh, you know uh, the f- there's funny stuff but like what t- typically we see that people make mistakes is that uh, we see that uh, if you you think a plastic is dry waste mm. uh, but if you think if you if you have a food container which has basically got some food in it and then you clean it up you think it's this some kind of wet residue unit mm-hmm. so they think that's wet waste and they don't give it to us in dry uh-huh. and vice versa in that sense as well uh so yeah we we've got a varied stuff that keeps coming in uh, time to time mm-hmm. uh, so yeah so there's to be a lot of awareness as well as well at the initial stage where you can segregate waste into apt categories but is the solution to all the problems that we are facing in terms of waste management or i would say resource collection um uh, banning plastics do you think that's the way to go about it so i personally think that plastics is actually one of the best inventions of mankind in the 21st century uh and the reason i say this is that uh, you know uh, leaving aside packaging uh, which of course we see as a problem but without plastics we wouldn't have had development in let's say um, it automobiles mm. healthcare plastics is entrenched in our lives mm. and it's part of every single sector and it's helped us actually do better mm. in most of this uh 
it's a it's a it's a lighter more durable more versatile material it's also cost effective in that mm. sense uh, so we created plastics because it was a better alternative yeah. than anything else so i don't think that banning is the right solution because um, i like to believe that plastics are here to stay mm. and the question that we need to ask ourselves is that not how we can live without plastics but how can we live with them because it's here to stay no yeah. matter what and when i say this it doesn't mean that please use more plastic yeah. that's not the that's mm, not the message i want to push out but reduce as much as you can uh, reuse as much as you can eliminate as much as you can but today there is no other large scale substitute that can immediately substitute all applications of plastic if you ban it today mm. uh, so while there is a large uh, economic side to it mm. there's also a social side which is like there there are millions of people that actually make an income either from the waste picking mm. the waste management or the recycling industry that are right now already employed there's a lot mm. of capex that's been employed in the recycling space mm. as well now what about the, yeah. the the people that have these jobs mm. so banning plastics is not the the way forward it's about uh, you know figuring out alternatives it's about reducing as much as you can and uh, and then looking at where we can how we can manage this better mm. in terms of that and also the government is talking a lot about recycling as you said a lot of people are employed in the space as well so how you can do it more efficiently is the question not just do it uh, like completely ban that in the case but uh, coming back to the fundraise it recently happened so congratulations on that uh, tell us more about how funding has been in the climate tech uh, segment so far there's been a lot of chatter around it but is there enough that's happening and with the funds that you have raised what do you plan to do so uh, the overall ecosystem in terms of climate tech or sustainability if you look at it uh, there has so there has been traction over the last few years but largely if you see earlier the the buzzwords were ev and solar yeah that's <laughs> majorly where the money was going into into sexy businesses <laughs> if you like to call it uh, you know that way but uh, more recently over the last few maybe a uh, couple of quarters or maybe a year or so we are seeing that there's a lot more traction coming into the other clean tech domains as well not just waste but even water even uh, you know sanitation and things like that uh, so there has been push in terms of uh, you know uh, vc is actually looking at this sector separately Uh, as compared to just having it this as the last bucket in terms of where they were putting in their money uh, and this is not and this has been pushed through the global actions that have been taken mm. place so there's a lot of tailwind in the sector uh, with the sustainable development goals with the local policy push that's come in uh, with the climate change uh, conversation that's happening across the globe so now we're seeing that it is and they've soon realized that climate change is real yeah. in that sense so there's more traction coming in the space itself uh, Our fundraise journey was fun, exciting. We're excited to, you know, work with these renowned uh, VC firms, investors that we have on board. But um, our main efforts in terms of uh, what we are going to be utilizing this fund is for further growing our business. So, largely looking at how we can digitize further. So, building our tech platform to ensure that we are bringing in end-to-end -end traceability across the supply chain. Uh, we're looking at. Uh, Uh, increasing capacities for our collection partners that actually work with us to formalize them while plastics is the main focus for us but we're also exploring other ways supply chains that we can get into so that we're able to even work large open up our market even larger and then of course uh, try and reach out to more brands to make sure that we are able to uh, you know increase our service offerings go deeper in terms of that we're working with uh, while right now our main focus is on the on the plastic credits but uh, we're working on also uh, now working towards how this recycled plastic now goes back into the supply yeah. chain of the brands that we work with which is the which is the bigger problem right if there's no demand for recycled plastic there's no recycling that's going to happen mm -hmm. and we're going to go back to square mm -hmm. zero uh so that's one of the focus areas that we are working towards right now i was actually going to ask you that uh, next what happens to the recycled plastics are there takers for that and do these companies or the brands that you work with who have given you this responsibility take that recycled plastic or the products back which are the brands that you're working with uh so we are uh, right now there are there is uh, so recycling in india has been happening for almost 2 to 3 decades you know so uh, there is a market for recycling however the challenge is that there's a lot of informal recycling sector the recycling sector is also quite informal uh, and at the same time uh, the granules that these guys are producing is being sold for inferior quality products mm. so if a, if you collect a pet bottle it's not going back to bottle to bottle but it's going to uh, an inferior which might go to buckets pipes okay i will go to mm. local markets mm. 
uh so there wasn't a demand for recycled plastic earlier but now as a part of the global commitments that these large mncs have made also the local epr policy has now asked brands to start using recycled plastic as a part of their supply chain so it's starting at 30% from next financial year onwards mm-hmm. and then growing 10% year on year so if you're producing 100 tons you need to use at least 30% mm-hmm. of uh, recycled plastic in your supply chain so there is a demand that's coming in mm-hmm. uh, then we need to set strengthen our infrastructure for recycling so that we're able to create high grade recycled mm-hmm. ma- material which can go back into these supply mm-hmm. chains of these brands so uh, we did a pi- so in terms of what happens finally so there are multiple grades of plastics right so there's hd pp ld mm. pp uh, pet PD. pvc uh, so each of them have different applications but largely if i had to put it they'd go into three main buckets uh, one is that they are converted into granules mm. after they get recycled which is raw material to make any new products mm. out of it and the other is it's going into so pet bottles also get converted into fiber mm. so it's going into the textile industry uh, right. where they are able to you make garments out of this and technical th- textiles is it's po- it's polyester textile yeah. so basically your jerseys that you see a lot of these cricket teams yeah. the, the indian cricket team has a jersey which is made out of recycled plastic mm. bottle we recently saw uh, our prime minister narendra modi also wearing got yeah. a gift for the blue one the blue <laughs> one correct uh, which is made out of pet bottles yes. again as well so it goes into the textile market as well and the third being your uh, alternative application which mm. is plastics to oil plastics to roads plastics to briquettes mm. plastics as fuel mm. in that sense so these are the three main buckets but it goes up to down so we need to make sure that as right now it's going bottom to down, bottom mm. to up when i say that means maximum goes to alternative and other, and your uh, packaging other packaging materials but now how, we need to make sure that this material actually goes from bottle to bottle and that's the main aim that we need to work with and that's where the demand needs to start increasing from these brand owners that we're working with okay interesting uh, you also recently uh, received the ocean bound plastic certification what does that mean so ocean bound plastics is a, a certification issued by zero plastics ocean um and uh, basically this is an international body that has uh, audited our supply chain and audited our work that we do to ensure uh, of course one is on the social side to make sure there's no child labor there's proper mm-hmm. working conditions we are following entire ehs policies and the second is to certify that we are able to collect ocean bound plastic so our collection okay. center in mumbai uh essentially is located in dhaisar in mumbai mm-hmm. and that's where we are able to ensure that whatever material that technically would go in the ocean we are tapping before that and being able to collect so mm-hmm. similar to how our e- our plastic credits are getting sold to these epr customers there are there's a market that's coming up for uh, global customers that are basically uh, looking at collection of ocean bound plastic so th- the ocean bound plastics has certified to collect ocean bound mm-hmm. plastic material in that you sense got it oh okay all right so that's something you are starting with as well and will be expanding into you know when you spoke about um, plastic recycling the other word that that often comes up and has been a problem is microplastics um how does it happen while recycling does every plastic get recycled in the same way do you see some a uh, residue coming out of that and is it is it possible to recycle microplastics as well so uh first to identify what microplastics are it's basically plastic degrades mm. if you keep it in the open mm. and uh, and it degrades into very very small pieces which you can't see with the naked eye and which leaks into the environment so the challenge with microplastics is that uh, we need to make sure that the material gets collected properly and gets recovered and not gets leaked into the ocean itself mm. or into the landfills for mm. that matter of fact uh, on the recycling front as well when material does go for recycling uh, if it is an authorized registered recycler when i say that i mean they have all their clearances and their licenses in place most likely they have control environment in which they will ensure that there is no residue mm. or there is no leakage of either air water or any of those substances that happen which leaks microplastics into the ocean uh, but if it goes into unregistered hands or if it goes into if it leaks if it le- if it goes into our oceans or if it goes into our landfills it tends to basically leak and leach out in mm. in a long term perspective mm. and this is something that you cannot collect back mm. so uh what we need to work towards and this cannot be re- it, because it cannot be collected it cannot be recycled right. for that matter of fact uh we need to figure out how we are able to make good quality products ensure that they stay in the resource supply chain and not reach the landfills and mm. ocean so that there's enough recycling that happens with it it is a problem there's no 
there's no perfect solution for sustainability mm. i would say and each of these products have their own challenges mm. but uh, we need to make sure what is what is minimizing our impact in terms of whatever we're going ahead and using okay so efficiently um, managing everything that we are seeing as well um you spoke about how bigger companies or corporates also need to contribute or at least assist Uh, efficiently to ensure that there is resource allocation or efficient recycling as well are we seeing lot more public partner uh, public private partnerships are you in touch with say the bmc when it comes to the mumbai region are they actively participating here as well because they do have a lot of collection centers but would they need help of private players like you yeah our business model we do run we do do work with the bmc uh, in the hisar where we are managing the dry waste for one ward which is the r north ward in mumbai um and uh, our interaction with them uh, in in mumbai is definitely there and there's a, a, with the swachh bharat movement that's come up across india there's a lot of push that's come in uh, the municipalities are getting ranked on uh, how good they're doing in not just waste but water and sanitation and hygiene as well so there is of course movement that's happening in that space uh def and and while i say this of course there needs to be more <laughs> as well uh but uh, there's more traction in this space that's happened in the last 3 years as compared to the last two decades put mm-hmm. together so we are in the right direction <laughs> and we need to get more work that happens we don't directly work uh, with municipalities across india but we work with our partners that work with municipalities mm. uh, so uh, there is like there is a lot of traction coming in from the government as well to actually set up more infrastructure so this problem of waste is so large that there's no one person that can mm. be put given the full responsibility so you can't say that the government needs to do everything yeah and that's not the right attitude so we how i look at it is that governments need to set up the policy set up infrastructure so that there is you know enough management that can happen consumers like us needs to firstly start sorting and segregating mm. your waste ensure it gets disposed responsibly mm. also ask ask and choose the right brands mm. because we have the power to actually uh you know pick from what what is coming on the shelves from where we buy it from so who are the brands that are doing good and who are not doing good so pick the ones that mm. are actually doing better look for local so look look for local alternatives as well and then brands need to make sure that they are incentivizing the ecosystem to collect back the trash that they put out in the mm. market mm. so while the government is doing their work it's you know if you just emphasize that okay government needs to do their work and the other stakeholders mm. don't do anything it's still not going to work <laughs> so there is traction coming in but we need each stakeholder to come in and play their role oh absolutely because collaboration is the way to go and on that positive note rahul i would like to take your leave but thank you so much for joining us on this podcast it was very interesting to know various aspects of the recycling industry and how it can be made more efficient as well so definitely uh, we learn something new and with that we'll take your leave as well on this edition of the climate clock podcast stay tuned for more updates Thank you.